Fighting in Sudan has led to a new wave of violence in Darfur. Thousands have fled to neighboring Chad to escape attacks by militias. And there are fears this could reignite tribal tensions in the region. So, what's fueling this violence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. Sudan's army and paramilitary rapid support forces have been fighting for nearly two months now. Millions of people have been affected. But this latest battle is now threatening to reignite decades-old tensions in the western Darfur region. Doctors Without Borders say hundreds of civilians have been killed there since violence broke out in April. The battle began around the capital, Khartoum, but has since spread to many areas across the country. Darfur has become one of its main battlegrounds. People in the region say various militias are targeting civilians, and some have warned of massacres. Thousands of people have been crossing into neighboring Chad to escape the violence. We'll get to our guests in a moment, but first, this update from Zain Basravi, who's at a refugee camp on the Chad-Sudan border. Whenever we return to places like this, to these kinds of impromptu camps where people are arriving from West Darfur, primarily from Al Janaina, one thing becomes very clear, the conflict is not becoming smaller, it is becoming bigger because the number of people at places like this simply continues to grow. More and more people arrive into these kinds of conditions. They are living out in the open, exposed to the elements. It is incredibly hot and sunny now with, with very, very stark conditions overhead. But just hours ago, just last night, there was a thunderstorm and all of these people had to sleep through that. So. The situation here is dire. The circumstances require immediate attention. These people need immediate medical attention. They need water. They need food. And they are keen to say that they need that help as soon as possible from anyone who can give it. But something that they are also very quick to bring up, uh, very immediately after the idea of self-preservation here, they are concerned for those that are left behind. They want to speak to us. They want to speak to whoever comes. They want to tell their story. And what they keep saying is that they, despite these terrible conditions, they consider themselves the lucky ones because at least they are not still in El Janena. At least they are not still under constant attack by militias. They say they are worried for their friends and relatives. They describe terrible scenes. Many of the dead, people that continue to die on a daily basis, cannot be buried for two, at least two very important reasons. The people that are there cannot safely bring their bodies to bury them anywhere, and so they are storing them mostly in their own homes. The dead remain in their own homes. And the other problem that we've heard is that people don't have enough to eat. They simply don't have enough energy to dig the graves to put the people in. So incredibly difficult circumstances in El Janena, here in Adre, on the border, at these refugee camps. And everyone we speak to says the same thing. They want the international community to intervene, if necessary, by force. Zain Basravi in Adre, Eastern Chad, for Inside Story. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests now. In London, Maysoon Dahab, co-director of the Sudan Research Group at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And here in Doha, Abdul Wahab Al Effendi, a former Sudanese diplomat and now a professor of politics at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. A warm welcome to you both. Thanks for joining us today on Inside Story. Uh, Abdul Wahab, let me start with you today. So the conflict began around Khartoum, the country's capital, but fighting has spread to many parts of the country. Why has Darfur become one of the main battlegrounds? I, I think Darfur was the starting point for the militia, which is now uh, terrorizing Khartoum. Uh, they, uh, and before that, they were, there was conflict uh, from the 90s, unfortunately uh, helped rather than restricted by the former regime of Omar al-Bashir. Uh, between uh, uh, so-called Arab tribes, uh, which incorporated many uh, migrants from Chad, and the original uh, uh, inhabitants of Western Darfur in particular, the Masalit, uh, and the detention uh, escalated when the, the war started. 
uh, in 2002, uh, and later when the, uh, uh, the government uh, uh, recruited the so-called Janjaweed, who are uh, more or less rogue uh, Arab uh, fighters, uh, let's uh, not call them Arab, it's more nomadic fighters, uh, who included also a large number of non-Sudanese. Uh, what I think has, has been happening in Darfur now uh, is that when the militia, uh, the the uh, uh, the militia uh, of Hamati uh, has started some some of these conflicts uh, during the past three years, I think from nineteen uh, from two thousand and twenty. Uh, the uh, some of the uh, uh, the Arab component of, uh, of residents of uh, West Darfur have been engaged in uh, attacks on uh, the civilian population there. I mean, he himself uh, went to Darfur uh, allegedly to try to quieten things down. But uh, most people say he has been uh, uh, secretly supporting the uh, uh, the militia there, uh, who have uh, increased in power during the uh, transitional government, unfortunately, and who are armed with very heavy weapons, mm. uh, which uh, population they do not have a, a equivalent to. Uh, so I, I think now. Mm. Uh, with what happened in Khartoum, uh, maybe the um, the remnants of the uh, of the militia in uh, Western Darfur wanted to impose their authority for fear that uh, since people in the in Darfur might think that the militia has weakened mm. and try to uh, rise again, and this is where, where what we see now. Uh, Maysoon, I saw you nodding along to some of what Abdul Wahab was saying there, and it looked like you wanted to jump in, so please go ahead. I, I, um, we work with the community researchers across the Sudan, and right at the beginning of this conflict, what has come across from our colleagues in Al Jinaina was quite vivid and speaks to what Abdul Wahab was saying. Um, I, if I can put it in their words, uh, what they say about the situation there is um, to be honest, the situation is catastrophic and beyond description um, to them, the fact that Jinaina and, and, and many inaccessible places in Darfur are, are a bit of a black box. Um, but what we do know about the impact is that not only is it wide reaching and, 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 uh, and intense, but it is also um, compounded by the history of ethnic conflicts in Darfur. It, it speaks very much of a genocidal playbook that has just played itself out once more. And as humanitarian researchers, we study conflict the world over. And to be honest, we haven't seen anything like this before. This is, um, in essence, nothing short of a really a renewed genocidal campaign, um, unfortunately, and, and perhaps a greater impact under cover of war. All right, let's now bring in Hafiz Mohammed, Director of Justice Africa Sudan, a human and civil rights research institute based in Sudan. Uh, Hafiz, um, how much concern is there right now that decades-old tribal tensions could be reignited in Darfur, and, and what would that mean going forward? Yeah, the, the, the problem is we, we are actually back uh, to 2003, 2004 in, in terms of level of violence and the violence that actually uh, targeting people according to the tribal and, and ethnicity. And it is very serious this time because we don't have a functioning government in Khartoum. I think uh, the militias are exploiting that actually to cause the maximum harm and damage uh, to uh, uh, some tribes in some people in, in West Darfur. And that is a very dangerous situation now because there is no government to protect them and there is total state of lawlessness in, 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 in Darfur. Uh, Abdul Wahab, is what is happening in Darfur right now a kind of a continuation of the war that broke out there in 2003 and ended in 2020? Uh, well, not that, um, yes, in a sense, there is the, the same uh, partisans are uh, engaged. But I think what is different here, as uh, probably half is noted and is true, is that uh, in the past, the, uh, the fight was between uh, at least armed groups. 
uh, what's happening, I think, in Western Darfur is uh, mainly civilians are being targeted uh, by uh, the uh, the RSF, which was supposed was I think um, was put there uh, in, in in the last few years as a kind of protection force. It is supposed to be uh, the police and the military there, and uh, it is uh, confronting unarmed people and massacring them in uh, in an attempt to subjugate them. And I think this is an important uh, indication uh, that probably the uh, IGAD and the other African mediators and international mediators do not seem to understand the real problem in, uh, in Sudan at the moment. Uh, the real problem is that we have this rogue militia, which uh, nothing can seem to, uh, to deter it from uh, doing whatever it could want, uh, like uh, uh, here killing people, taking their property. In Khartoum, they are also terrorizing the people, getting into homes, hospitals, uh, stopping people in the road, people disappear like that. And uh, the international community seems to think that uh, by uh, what is needed is for the people who are fighting this uh, militia to stop fighting it, uh, hoping that if that happens, the militia will be tamed and just sit down and be nice to people. Mm. I think what is probably needed is more uh, firepower. Mm. Uh, I think uh, we should call for international intervention in Western Darfur at the moment. Otherwise, we'll be condoning genocide. Uh, Maysoon, you were speaking earlier about what you called a catastrophic situation uh, facing uh, uh, facing Darfur. And I want to ask you more specifically uh, about just how dire the humanitarian situation is there. So in, in my colleagues' words, and I quote, um, they say, if this situation continues in Algenina, it will be worse than you can imagine. They say that it will be worse than the mass ethnic cleansings of past because there are multiple ways that you can die directly by a bullet, an untreated injury, or chronic disease, stuck in a burning house that you cannot leave, or of thirst. Even if you go out to get the water that you need to survive, you get killed. They are very emphatic that an urgent and large-scale humanitarian intervention is what is needed to save what is left. Uh, Hafez, uh, you heard there Maysoon talking about uh, El Janina specifically, and, and I want to ask you about that, because if we're looking at what's going on in, in Darfur, it seems like the violence in El Janina started out as sort of an offshoot of the wider war in Sudan, but, but a lot of aid groups are now saying that it seems to have become a war in its own right. Why is El Janina such a hot spot in the conflict right now? Yeah, because, because there is um, um, conflict uh, based on a tribal and ethnic uh, line, and also at the same time, uh, land and 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 resources. And I think, and that I said, been going on for long. You know, uh, fighting around Jebel Moon and and this area, which is rich with minerals, and also the new settlers who actually came and took over land of the indigenous Darfuri from Syria, uh, from uh, uh, Masalita and other uh, tribes. And the main reason for that, I think. It's clear it is ethnic cleansing with, with all its attempts. It's totally ethnic cleansing because there are these people, they are already displaced. There's too many IDPs come and also refugees in chat. And, the, and, and, and these militias are not actually uh, from Sudan. Also, they're coming from neighboring country. And there's a clear orchestrated campaign based on ethnic and tribal line and try also to confiscate the land. I think even people are talking about changing even the name of 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 uh, was that for different name. Just take the the the, the word war, four out of it. And I think that orchestrated and been going on. It's been going on uh, for a very long time, and the uh, and increase because of the the, the ongoing war in Khartoum, and that is actually fueling it more. And I think without having international or regional intervention in terms of um, mm. peacekeeping to enforce law and order. I don't think we'll see any peace in Darfur. And it's going to be even worse, worse than 
maybe I don't want to exaggerate, but it might be another Rwanda. All right, so, so I want to take a step back for a moment. As we mentioned, the fighting in Sudan risks reigniting a decades-old conflict in the western Darfur region. In 2003, intercommunal violence began when the Sudanese government deployed the so-called Janjaweed militia to put down an uprising by tribal groups. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. The U.N. says 2.5 million people were displaced. The conflict ended in 2020, but violent disputes between tribes sparked by land and access to water continue. The leader of the Rapid Support Forces, Hamid Hamdan Dagalo, rose through the ranks of the Janjaweed. Now, Abdul Wahab, uh, let me ask you, as we mentioned there, the conflict may have ended in 2020, but violent disputes between tribes over land and access to water continue. Why has that continued? Uh, I think the, the fighting between the groups, therefore, had died down uh, for quite a while, uh, wasn't going on. I think the the uh, new configuration, especially in Western Darfur, is that uh, while uh, in, in in the 2000s, in the between 2000 until uh, 2013, uh, the militias uh, were uh, small in number and were under control of the army. Uh, to all the security agencies to be more precise, and their numbers were small. In the past uh, four or five years, uh, the number, uh, the, the militia was given a formal uh, uh, designation as rapid support forces, which was first part of the security uh, uh, apparatus and then became part of the army and then it became independent of the army, and it was given heavy weapons, which it didn't have in the past. It was given a kind of official, actually. It is now officially uh, a government force in, uh, in Western Darfur. So it is supposed to be the protective uh, agency of the people there, but as Happy de Khartoum has now turned rogue, and is acting on its own account, not mm -hmm. for the state. And I think this is this is the danger we are we are in now, that because in the past four or five years mm -hmm. uh, the military, the police, and and all was weakened, and we have this uh, this kind of semi-official, uh, but now rogue uh, militia. Uh, I think, and they these people have an agenda. Their mm -hmm. agenda has been take over the land of the Masalit and throw them out. Mm. And uh, uh, I think this is, this, is, this is where the Rwanda example uh, has, has a river. Uh, Maysoon, thousands of people have been crossing into neighboring Chad to escape the violence. Uh, for those who are attempting to flee to Chad, how difficult and how dangerous is that journey? I will quote my colleagues again in, in this. Uh, they said to try to move to a place of safety across the border within Sudan is, I quote, a suicide mission. It is incredibly difficult. And so many people do manage to get out, but at a great cost, many do stay. And because of the history of the conflict in places like El Jinina, the, the populations tend to be concentrated in highly populated residential, residential areas, which are deemed to be safer. And at the beginning of this conflict, those who weren't able to leave moved into large uh, ex-student dormitories to try to shelter, and those were shelled. Since then, there's an estimated 200,000 internally displaced within El Jinina, living in open air with no shelter, no safety. and um, uh, and I quote again, they say, every one of these heavily populated neighborhoods, um, when the militia enter, they burn it down to the ground, they rob and pillage, and they kill, especially those who are un un unable to run, the elderly, handicapped, um, and the blind. And we've had um, from our colleagues um, reports of um, uh, violence against uh, women, especially gender uh, sexual-based violence um, um, in terms of rape. Again, the decision to leave is difficult and fraught. The decision to stay, sometimes it's not a decision, you just have to stay, um, is deadly.
And Maysoon, I just want to follow up with you to ask about the kind of access that humanitarian groups uh, have been able to, to get. I mean, is that just not happening right now? Uh, is there any hope that there could be a humanitarian corridor set up or that humanitarian actors would be able to access the people who need aid and, and medical help the most? I can summarize the humanitarian access in one word at the moment, which is none. There is no humanitarian access um, into Algenina, even within the within the city itself. Just moving about to provide support for um, members of your own community can be deadly, and so um, much of the response that is being mounted is very much a localized, community-led effort, and it is extremely hampered by the security situation. You know, colleagues described scenes of just stepping out of their house putting a, out, a hand out or a foot out and being shot at by snipers. So what they're having to do, and also health workers are being targeted, what they're having to do in some places is operate what they call secret neighborhood clinics. These are clinics that are hidden from the outside that are only available um, to those who know how to get there and, and, and are close to it. But this is, of course, not filling in the void in any way. So, of course, um, we've asked, what is it that you need? And they said what we need quickly and urgently is security, um, a provision of uh, humanitarian corridors to provide basic health services, to provide established displaced people camps with full services um, to those folks. But the reality is that we don't know when that humanitarian corridor is going to be opened. And and, and that's, mm. that obviously should be the focus, right? We need to push for that. There's no way around it. So long as people can step outside of their houses, no one is safe, um, not inside Del Jinena and no one coming in. So mm. what we want to call for is an ability to map those first responders to understand who is doing what, where, and calling really for the humanitarian um, health community to change TAC and to change TAC quickly. We need to adjust to the situation and support those first responders who are already on the ground by any means necessary. And I think in that case, they can take example from uh, civil society diaspora groups like... Mm. The Sudanese Union groups in the UK who have mobilized to support community-led initiatives in places like Lubaid and Halfa, providing whatever they can from a distance to mobilize those health cadres that are inside um, the city and to get them through until those humanitarian corridors are open. Hafiz, how much concern is there right now about unrest in Western Darfur destabilizing neighboring countries, uh, in particular Chad, for example? No, definitely, definitely, the, the, the magnitude of uh, displacement and people actually moving to, to chat, chat itself have no um, ability to, to provide them support because uh, the infrastructure in Chad is, is, is very poor and, and, and uh, uh, the Chadian authority have said it clearly that uh, they are not able to provide the needed support for these people. And, and, and I see that clear. If, and if uh, the, the, the conflict continues the same level, and I think we will see more people fleeing to uh, Chad and Central Africa, and these countries themselves are not stable. They have uh, security problems, they have um, you know, uh, aid problems, and that is going to complicate the situation even more. I think that is why what I'm saying is we really need uh, 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 humanitarian uh, protection for these people, mm. uh, it's PT humanitarian, humanitarian assistance to allow access for humanitarian workers to work and also to protect them because the main problem is, is now protection because most of the international agencies are uh, working on humanitarian withdraw their staff because that they cannot secure uh, them and they, mm. uh, there is no access, safe access to, to get to these people. I think what we need, uh, need urgently, if we want to at least to contain the, the, this problem to some extent, is to have force which provide protection for humanitarian uh, mm. workers and also to protect these refugees because the, the, it is, the rain is coming and people are, are going to be a problem because sanitation is a problem, clean water is a problem, food is a problem, and then we will have illnesses due to uh, displacement and also rain because the rain is just going to start and mm. that is going to complicate the problem even more. Urgent action is needed from the international community, otherwise uh, hundreds of thousands of people will lose their life. Uh, Abdul Wahab, have any of the ceasefires that have gone into effect uh, up until now, ha have they done anything to lessen the violence in Western Darfur? And also, are there any concrete steps that can be taken in order to try to get things under control in Darfur? There should be unequivocal uh, message sent 
uh, to the leader of the Jinjaweed uh, that if this does not stop and stop now, and also if he does not stop what he's doing in Khartoum, uh, occupying hospitals and people's homes and terrorizing people, uh, he should, his organization should be declared a terrorist organization and he should be hunted. I think this, Hab- this is the only way you can stop what's happening there. Abdul, I'm sorry to bother you. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. We, we just have a minute left. I want to ask May Soon uh, one last question here. Uh, May Soon, from your perspective, what has to happen in order to ensure that either a humanitarian corridor can be set up or that people who are most in need of aid can get it? That's the million dollar question. I will tell you that that answer has to come from external sources. The people of this region have been subjected to compound compound vulnerabilities. We're not talking about a war inflicted on a, yesterday or a month ago or two months ago. We go back 20 years. These are communities that have been brought down to their knees. And so their essential resilience and their ability to speak out and to, to change things on their own is not there. And so uh, my colleagues have alluded to the fact that the external pressures are absolutely essential. They are trying to amplify their voices to describe what a hell on earth they are living in. But they cannot be asked to do more than survive at the moment. And so to open these corridors, we need to continue to put the pressure externally and to make spaces where we can little and as incremental is, is a way forward. But I think in the meantime, let's be realistic. Those people who are on the ground and responding mm. as we speak need the support now. We cannot wait. And there are ways to be able mm. to do that. And we need to put our caps on and to follow the lead of civil society here, which have shown an incredible way forward. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thanks so much to all of our guests, Hafiz Mohammed, Maysoon Dahab, and Abdul Wahab El Effendi. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the entire team here, bye for now.